this Thursday, I think, in our service, I promised our people back home that I was going to share about the three uh, kinds of voices of the Spirit. God speaks three kinds of voices. Okay? And every minister, every believer, every uh, Christian has to understand the full uh, revelation of these voices. When they say this is a man who fully hears God, what do we mean? Okay? The first voice... Uh, of distinction eh? is the voice that aligns you to purpose and course the, the voice that aligns you to your destiny and that voice must stay constantly alive to the minister and believer because sometimes when you're paving off when you're walking off it brings you back you understand many believers you will read or some of you have read church history i'll give a few examples which began so well but in the middle there they veered off into another direction that the lord had not called them to go some of you if you've had read uh, church history for example the revivals that took place in the united states alexander Dowie was a very anointed man very anointed he was so rich that he built a city zion illinois but for those of you who have not heard of the story later on he started to take on a more professional responsibility of which the lord had not called him to and he lost the voice of purpose and destiny. And he was a gifted man. I, in the history of healing, the healing graces, Alexander Doe is up there. He's probably among the top five healing evangelists that we have had uh, in, in as long as we can remember, say from 1900 up to now. They, 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 he, he was a man of his own class. I, he, he healed sick people until doctors went back plumbing. Parents started advising their children not to study medicine. They pleaded with their children, please don't bring poverty in the family. You understand? (laughs) Because Zion Illinois, it was recorded even in the history of the United States that it was the most healthy city in his time. People never used to fall sick. People never used to die. Until Alexander died, then people started dying and falling sick. (laughs) It's how much the Lord had given him. But later on, he veered off into another life and teaching. And no, something else. He tried to become uh, more administrative in his latter lines of, the, of, of, of life. And when he started Zion Illinois, he did not hand it over uh, to administrative minds and, 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 and men that were able to manage it. He became the sole manager of this. And then he veered off the course, and eventually he died a very ungodly death because he walked out of eternal purpose another story of a man called william branham some of you have heard either in a good way or bad way william branham began right he was the lord's prophet and healing machine that man used to prophesy and heal it if you read his account it would scare you just how much he used to do it he in his day he had some of the biggest tent meetings ever and one time william branham woke up in the morning and admired another healing fellow, I think, who there in that time was probably healing and prophesying, but he was teaching. So William Branham went into teaching, okay? Started teaching, and then one of his assistants then, uh, who was Gordon Lindsay, comes and sits him down and tells him, you are starting now to vie off the calling of God. God called you to heal, prophesy, and, 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 and win souls. Continue in that. It was more like a healing, prophetic, but evangelistic movement. Do that and just, you'll be fine. Uh, but he this was the assistant what was he saying william tells him i simply i just simply like to teach of course many people criticized him during his day because later on that latter rain movement earned a very unprecedented reputation in some teachings such as uh, he taught that when you sin you have to rededicate your life to christ that's why up to today we still have people who think like that that when a man lies at 10 a.m he has lost his salvation he has to come back and get born again again yet they say we have jesus purchased our eternal salvation what is eternal about something that can go away at 10 a.m praise the lord you see so there are people who used to come in and say ah for me i I, 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 I seen that 10 now, I've lost everything now. They come back again afresh. So I don't know whether in your churches you've seen people who are getting born again again. Eh? Every time when things become too much, they say, now, now this time. Eh? The other time it wasn't right. I, but however, I, I give provision for people who are getting born again 
this time when they have realized that their first encounter of salvation was not a reality of conviction but rather an escaping route from danger because sometimes we introduce men to salvation through the problems they have you understand like somebody once told me that if you find a pregnant woman who is like two hours to giving birth and you tell her receive jesus she'll just say lead me don't even waste time because death is nigh you understand <laughs> death is what closer than she ever believed so because of that sometimes we find people with family problems then the tamba says you know what sister receive jesus this man will come back so the sister receives jesus such that the man what do you think she has understood the blood that was shed the love that jesus has brought to her the meaning of life the life of salvation the walking in holiness, righteousness, peace, joy, victory, faith, the distinctions of the gospel. No. And then they enter the gospel because they want to run away from issues. So demons are, are disturbing you. Then they say, ah, if you want these demons to live, receive Jesus. Some of us even force people. We trick people into salvation. <laughs> we trick people into salvation. You have demons. Eh? Now, if you want them to leave you, receive Jesus. If you don't receive Jesus, they won't leave you. But that is a lie. Jesus rebuked devils out of men, even who are not believers. You remember the guy who had legion? That man was not born again. He did not refuse Jesus to exercise the God-given authority. So we tell people, if you don't receive Jesus, these demons will not go. So they receive Jesus for demons to go, not for the personal relationship and revelation of what Jesus did. It's the very Hebrew word for mixed multitudes. You remember when the children of Israel crossed from Egypt into, as they were heading into the wilderness, into the promised land? The Bible says they crossed along with mixed multitudes. If you read the root definition in the Hebrew of mixed multitudes, you realize it is a place of... Mixed multitudes literally represents people who come in simply for safety or a promise of better things to come. But really things. You know there are people who, who just come, came into salvation because they were promised of a better future. You understand? Come to salvation. That poverty will leave your house. Then somebody comes and says, I'm tired of poverty. Then they come to receive Jesus Christ. You see? And, 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 and we are having trouble because some people, we reach at the end and we are shocked that people are not born again. Heaven will shock us. Praise the Lord. Heaven will what? Shock us. Because some people, they have gotten so into the system that they almost look like Everything has been, they've been baptized. They're even speaking in tongues. One of those days when I was still a younger minister and I used to sometimes do things, even me, I wonder why I used to do them. But one day I just woke up and the Lord told me there were people who were, who were speaking fake tongues. And I said, everyone put up your hands. Now I said, everyone speaking in a false tongue. Power! Guys fell down. They started rolling like demons. I saw a girl who was rolling like a snake. But the same person... Before the beginning of service, I found out, Shepakata, Shepakata. I said, <laughs> Some of you, even the times you're speaking, you're in trouble. You, 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 you dare me to try it, you'll see. <laughs> you'll see somebody say, Rababa. Then the next thing, they're down on the ground, rolling on a snake like a snake. And you, I was wondering, deliverance took place. One even was vomiting things. Yet she was speaking in tongues. But you, you see, something is it possible. Read your Bible. At least they give you a Jesus that was not given, a gospel that was not preached, and a spirit that was not from him. He says, and you bear them for yourselves. That means somebody can preach you another Jesus, give you another spirit, and give you another gospel. When so you think you're born again, you even speak tongues in that spirit. Not everyone who calls Lord, Lord, is really established in the teaching of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. For he has, he that cometh preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached. If you receive another spirit which you have not received, or another gospel which we have not accepted, you might as well bear with him. So, it's possible to have another gospel, another spirit, and another Jesus. Not this one we are preaching. You understand? So, I saw deliverance taking place. And after that, they were filled with the true spirit and started speaking in real tongues. One of them I see is a very wonderful minister in Kampala, but I don't give records because I don't want them to say this woman. I, I know. Praise the Lord. It was the Lord's doing and it was good. Somebody say, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, 
until one prophet one time prophesied the death of William Branham, the day, the day, the time, and because he was a prophet, for him he thought he hears God more than anyone else, and he died. But William died simply because he did not hear the voice. He walked out from the voice of eternal purpose. I'll teach those things this week. Then there's a voice of the judgments of God. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. To understand the judgments of God. To reconcile revelation and your intellect. The experiences of the spirit. And to, re- to, to reconcile with your mind. To understand the judgments of God. The very key voice too. And the third one is the voice of the message of the gospel. I am going to share things tonight that are going to shock you on how many of us have misheard, misinterpreted, misrepresented the gospel. Again, like I said, from an apostolic angle, the things I'm sharing, if you don't understand that I love you and God does, you will take offense. Praise the Lord. But if you understand the love of God, even me, these things sobered me one time. I just woke up and I, they were there and I had the choice to run away from them or to accept the truth and allow God to work through me. And I'm humble enough to break when I err. Praise the Lord. No true man of God cannot be corrected. Even me, I'm corrected up to this age. I have people over me who call me and say, ah, here, yeah, rub it. And I call the editing team and I tell them, rub this one. I say, why? Ah, a man of God told me it's not right. You see, so you have to be accountable of some sort. Praise the Lord Jesus. Anyway, the, I started to realize that the reason why we were not growing ministry, ministers, individuals, you and I, the business, everything that you, the career, the calling of God upon your life. It was because we were simply presented with another message. We were simply presented with another message. Praise the Lord. Back to church history that I touched yesterday a bit. When the East African revival came, it came through the Anglican and Protestant movement. Okay? Which Protestant movement also later on got a bit corrupted. I don't know that you know that. Because what was the basis of Protestantism? The word Protestant means they were protesting. What were they protesting against? The teaching, the cardinal teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. What were the cardinal teachings of the Roman Catholic Church? The spirit of legalism. How many of you understand what I'm saying? It was the spirit of legalism. The Roman Catholic Church was too legal. Too legal. Too legal. That you've heard of stories I shared recently, even in our church. You've heard of stories of, uh, if you're a Roman Catholic before, you have heard of stories where people even used to punish themselves when they sin. Eh? Either they beat themselves or they cut themselves. Or they, who, 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 knew, who knew that that actually, you, you know that, eh? What do they used to call it? Penitence or? Hmm? Penitence, right? Where you, ha- you, you have to af- inflict on yourself because you've, you've hurt God. <laughs> yeah, you have to pay for your sins. You understand? And this thing went as far as men used to lash themselves, some people used to burn themselves, some people used to cut themselves, some people used to... It was too ugly. It was too ugly. It was too ugly. And there's a man called Martin Luther. Martin Luther wakes up one day and he had sinned, so he breaks glass. When he breaks glass, he was supposed to crawl on it when it's pricking his fingers and legs, right? And feet. So he was on all his fours like a baby. And while he's creeping on, the story is given that while he's in the middle of this glass, things are going through his, his, his fingers. He feels like he's paying for, he's atoning for his sin. He, Jesus. In the middle there, the voice comes to him and brings a scripture he always read since he was a child, but he never understood. Again, like many of us, have been blinded and veiled from the voice of the message. And God tells Martin Luther... You are justified by faith. Martin Luther is like, what? He walked off that glass and went and penned down what they call the 95-page thesis of Martin Luther. And then he went and stamped it on the Wittenberg Church, Roman Catholic Church. And that was the beginning of what you and I call the Protestant movement. They were protesting against legalism and the doctrine that was hit on that 95 page thesis was justification by faith that was martin luther's revelation praise the lord 
in the history of the world there has never ensued war there has never ensued debates there has never ensued fightings within and without like the fight between the legalistic spirit and the doctrine of justification by faith or righteousness imputed by faith and i'm going to say a few things and you're going to realize it is the real drawing mark between the battles that we are having in the body of Christ across the world. It has been now a proven fact that the Pentecostal movement alone has split into more than a thousand denominations. Even if you get ten pastors now and put a scripture, then we might not agree, including me. <laughs> <laughs> On the same what? Scripture. But the biggest dividing line is between the legalistic teaching and the justification through faith. And I'm going to preach that. I'm going to preach that. I'm going to, I'm going to expound a bit more. Because hey, you came early. Thank you for coming early. Praise the Lord Jesus. You came early. Thank you for coming early. And I'm going to awaken your eyes to something. You know, a man can walk in darkness and think he's in light. Because sometimes the true spirit of deception is to present light as darkness. Or darkness as light. That is why the Bible says in Matthew, if the light in thee be darkness, oh, what great darkness it is. If the light in thee, he says, but if thine eye be evil, thine whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great that darkness. In other words, the deepest, the deepest, the deepest form of darkness represents itself as a form of light to them that are deceived. How many of you have understood what I have just said? The deepest form of darkness represents itself as a form of light to men who are deceived. And a man can walk in light yet in great darkness. And that man can assume that the, the other ones are walking in darkness. You understand what I'm saying? And for example, I'm going to share a few things, then at the end of service remind me to ask you a question. Eh? Remind me to ask you a question. You're going to understand what I mean by darkness and what? And, and, and light. Praise the Lord. For example, I wrote something a couple of days ago. I did a little research. I went through to search out on the formation of the religions of the world. Praise the Lord. And when I studied the religions of the world, I think I'll read for you something very, very interesting. Let me read for you something very interesting. When I studied the part of the religions of the world, I realized, how many of you have heard of Mormonists or Mormonism? Mormonism was begun by a gentleman called Joseph Smith. And Joseph Smith says, a light appeared, and in that light an angel called Moroni appeared. And when Moroni came, he taught doctrines like all souls pre-exist as angels, etc. Et That's how Mormonism was birthed, through a light and an angel called Moroni. If you go to Islam, you know that Muhammad claims that in the tomb, sorry, in the, in the what do they call it? That cave, he encountered the angel Gabriel. And it was a light. The seventh Adventist, Ellen G. White, she claims that there was an accompanying light of an angel too that follows the Jehovah's Witnesses. They believe that a, a, a light appeared at the watchtower in the headquarters in New York in 1914. The Catholics... You know the, the lady of light. <laughs> Buddhists have an angel called Kuan Yin. He came in a light. The New Age movement also have an angel of light. They call themselves the enlightened ones to higher consciousness. They are illuminated. You know what illuminati is. They, they are lightened by a certain power. So, Everything that has light is not necessarily truth. All world religions were begotten by light. You understand what I'm saying? But the maturity to separate that light and darkness is the beginning of your true walk with Jesus Christ. Somebody shout hallelujah. Now, I'm going to share certain things that seem like were light but are actually darkness. And things that seem like to some people are, they have even been misinformed that they are darkness, yet they are the true light. I'm going to share that. So, have you ever asked yourself how one day Jesus wakes up and they put him before a thief and a murderer and they tell these Jews to choose and they chose a thief to be released to kill them? 
It is how deceived men can be. That they put Jesus on a thief and they chose a thief. Paul, if you ask yourself, why was he beaten? For healing the sick and casting out devils and cleansing lepers? Why was Jesus crucified? What did he do? He blasphemed. Paul was accused of blasphemy. Peter was accused of blasphemy. You understand what I'm saying? All those guys were accused of blasphemy. They abused the God of the other people who were righteous, who saw the true light. Praise the Lord. And one of the chances are that, again, in our generation, we are repeating the same mistakes. And I'm going to show that. I'm going to show that. The Bible says, you will know of me if you know my doctrine. You will know me when you know my doctrine. You will know Jesus when you understand his doctrine. You'll understand his doctrine when you know him. You'll know him when you understand his doctrine. That means a man who doesn't understand the true teaching of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, he doesn't know him. He might look, appear, sound, you know, but he doesn't know him. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Who wrote almost three-thirds of the New Testament? Paul. Why Paul? I'll explain that. Paul comes in the gospel in the setting when Rome or Romans had the Roman Empire had besieged Israel. So Israel was a subject of the Roman Empire. And because of that, they used to have system by which systems by which they used to rule their subjects. Okay? And some of which examples were rewarding the spiritual Jewish leaders then. That is why if you go back through church history, you realize that Rome used to reward the Pharisee, the Sadducee, and the Essen. Essens were some of the richest class of the Jews. And that's the example of the Essen is the young man who comes to Jesus, who has done everything all his life. And Jesus tells him, go and sell your riches. He went away and said, boss, preach your other thing. This is not true. But Jesus was just trying to take to check his heart. So Paul is raised in a time as such, okay, where Rome ruled the Jews. And there's always a place where the church gets into bed with government. Okay? And every time the church has submitted itself uh, and compromised from the convictions of the truth because they need to serve higher authority, we have begotten religion, the spirit. The religion, spirit, the spirit of religion, 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 if you read Latin, re, prefix, to go back, legion, into bondage, okay? That's the spirit of religion, Okay? It takes man back to bondage. By not giving them the truth. Deception. I'll give you an example. When you became born again, when I became born again, I have a blue book. I kept, when I, no, when I just, no, not really born again, but when I returned, there was a time I walked away because the church wasn't making sense. So I returned later on. Why are you laughing? <laughs> huh? Sorry? The church wasn't making sense? Yes, there was a... Uh, but you, you know that there was a time where the church... Some of you have been through what I went through. Yeah. Where you go to church, and the things they are speaking, they don't make sense. Then you say, ah, no. Let me go and happen. I'll come back when they make sense. <laughs> and, and some people ask me why we have young people, many young people in our ministry. I'll tell you why. Because many of them had walked away from things that don't make sense. It's not an abuse, it's the truth. Even me, I'm trying right now to make sense. So, <laughs> so I walked away. And then returning back, I go on this conference and this man was teaching something very interesting. And they were teaching demonology. But very anointed guys who deliver, who cast out devils. And if I say this, you might think I don't understand that life. I ask people who know me. If I decide to do a deliverance service here, some of you might not, you might, if I, if I just say, let me now deal with devils a certain way. I have my madness. 
One time we went to Kamocha. This guy wanted the delivery service. I said, Doc, I'll give you a delivery service. <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God. The, the church. So it doesn't, even now I still do deliverance, by the way. If, if you have a thing on you and you feel you need it to go today, back on your seatbelts. At the end of service, you will go. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So I'm not speaking as someone who has not demonstrated power. But I'm also telling you that there was a time we demonstrated power in deception. And so I started to see, we used to cast out devils. You cast out devils out of this woman every year. <laughs> She's the one who is. <laughs> then you say, now this one, I think it has gone. Then tomorrow she vomits. Then the other day she somersaults. The fourth day she bites her neighbor. The fifth day she punches every usher and you're like, now this one. She's free. And then, sadly, I used to observe and one day I woke up three years after demonstration and these wee people were the same way. I found them except that some had made babies illegally and I, I didn't get it. So I knew I had a problem. I knew there was a problem. Because what was I delivering that wasn't finally living? Have you chased something for 20 years? Eh? Then they tell you, here, you, you, you prayed when you are not facing north. Face north, then you face north. <laughs> then it refused. Then they told you, no, midnight. Enter the life of prayer when the hours of the, uh, the day are changing. <laughs> then you say, this time for my family, midnight, 11.50, rakata, kata, kata. You open the day with prayer. Nothing. Then they tell you, ah, ah. There is something at the 3 a.m. There is a 3 a.m. hour. The Bible says in the third hour. <laughs> when you wake up at 3, you start hitting things at 3. It even becomes a, a doctrine in you. You say at every 3 a.m. I am awake. Even your brain is tuned. 3 a.m. you are breaking. Then I broke at 3 a.m. Nothing changed. Then they brought us doctrine of salt. You are the salt, but then the salt outside. Ah, ah, <laughs> God gave David and his generation and his descendants Somalia, the, the, the kingdom and forever through the, the kingdom, the, 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 what, the, the covenant of salt. Father, I make a covenant of salt with you. Tata, split it, nothing. <laughs> Oil came through. Some of you even drank it. I have a church member, before she joined the church, they made her drink oil. She had diarrhea. <laughs> She called the pastor and said, Pastor, my stomach is running. The pastor says, Now demons are leaving my sister. <laughs> demons are leaving. <laughs> Nothing. Right. When oil left, she same demon, same demon, same story. Praise God. Until I said, No, you shall know the truth. <laughs> the truth. So I say to realize it's the responsibility of truth to make me free. If I know the truth. For who saw the sun sets? Who saw? Not your uncle or the man of God. No. If a man of God sets you free, you can get bound again. You can go back in the same thing we rebuked out of you. But if so the sun sets you free, you are free indeed. So up to today, I still cast out devils. But I prefer to give men truth first. Yeah. Why? This was the mistake we used to make. Because we didn't have truth. Like the Bible says, you cast that devil out of a man, he goes in the dry places, seeks for a place to rest, and finds none. And he comes back in this house. Then he finds revelation, then he finds foundation, then he finds truth. So he says, ah, she's free. He goes back and collects eight more devils. And comes back into this woman. And the place of that person, the Bible says, is worse than the first. So today if she was kicking, tomorrow she bites and they say, ah, now the anointing on this man has increased. No, the anointing didn't increase. <laughs> the demons increased. <laughs> now you do your mathematics. You send one out, it brings what? Seven. Right? You send eight out and those eight bring seven. What is eight times seven? That is the second deliverance service. Eh? Fifty-six. Fifty-six. Uh -huh. Then... You, you cast out 56 on the third delivering service. How many come back times 7? Uh -uh, do your math. 392, right? Then you cast out 392 on the fourth delivering service. Huh? And then 
and then you, you they, they, they again come back. What is 392 times 7? Uh-uh, Munyambe, help me. So somebody has 2,744 demons in the first deliverance service, but they were rolling on the floor. And you realize, ever since this woman started deliverance service, she has become worse. Ever since this person started going for deliverance service, they've become worse. And then what happens? We create an atmosphere where they can't be set without us. Because now I am the prophet. When I speak, you have to listen. If you don't do it the way I want, eat grass. Then they eat grass. <laughs> Why? Deliverance, they are free. Hey, tomorrow don't come with your knickers. They all don't... Ah. You've heard of those things. Haven't you heard of them? Because people are desperate to be never not. So, you have a bunch of Christianity that is beggarly, poor, abound, people struggling, but, and the more they pray, the more they worsen. Then they also bring them in another doctrine. You know when you pray, when you, are, when you are born again, you're a baby. So like a baby, God gives you everything. So when you grow, you have to now learn to also do for your things the same thing. So what happens? So what used to come easy starts to become harder. <laughs> Wait, things are supposed to become easier for me. Now that I'm matured in the things of the spirit. It's not the other way around. I said, no, when you're a baby, God gave you for free. Now, when I went for that conference, they taught us. I have a book up to now, and I kept it because of anger. Every time I open it, I'm inspired to preach. When I feel bored and I feel like I'm too lazy, or I've eaten too much fat, and I feel like I want to be apostolic, when I look at that book, I come up again and I feel like I want to preach. But I'll explain why. The man started like this. He said, when you have house flies in the house, and then you spray them, and then they come back, and then you spray them, and they come back. What's the possibility? Possibility is that there's something in the house that you have to get out. So he has, until you remove that thing, the house flies will not leave. You understand what I'm saying? That's where the deception began from. Don't worry, even me, I taught it. <laughs> even me, what? Because for me, it also came like a mystery. It hit my head. I said, this is truth. So even me, I went back home and I told my family, you see, when house flies, <laughs> Apostle! <laughs> even me, what? I told you. So they say, you have to deal with the thing. Okay? So now they are trying to take us to a place that every evil thing happening to you is because of a certain demon spirit. You see? Sometimes it is, but sometimes it's not. And that is the real truth. I told people, if Joseph lived in our time, you would have a spirit of rejection. You, you have rejection. I see that your brothers threw you in a pit. That's true, man of God. And I see in a pit you were taken to a priest. That's true, man of God. And even in the, in the house of Potiphar, they arrested you. <laughs> you have a spirit of rejection. Even when they come for prayer, apostle, I went and then I went in the family and then they chased me. That God is trying to take you to where you belong. You're interrupting the story because you think that somebody shout hallelujah. I'm not saying deliverance is not supposed to. No, I, like I said, up to today, if you watch my videos, I cast out devils. Up to today. Sometimes I don't even cast out. When they come in my presence, they start screaming. You understand? And if you want me to demonstrate on you, I can do it just to show you that I have power <laughs> to cast out <laughs> devils. <laughs> you understand? But you see, we also created another form of place where people started to depend on us for survival. And that was idolatry. We became idols in the hearts of men because we couldn't point them back to the word. We became their answer. At 3 a.m., apostle, it has come. If <laughs> You break power, power. So the man of God, you as a man of God, you become like you are a necessary. You understand? That used to make us tired because we were cut, we were praying for people every time. Until you run out of air, you can't even breathe. The same people who you ask God for, they start to stress you. You look at the person, you even walk the other side like you didn't say that. 
Yet at one time he told God, Give me people. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. Am I communicating? Yes. No, let me give you an example. The Bible says in Galatians 6, it says, For Christ, for liberty, Christ has died for you. Okay? For liberty. When you became born again, the Bible says, No, it's five. Stand first, therefore. Listen, listen to the instruction of the teacher. Stand first, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. What does that mean? It means when you become born again, you're free. And Paul tells you, from freedom, labor to stand. So that you don't go back in bondage again. For us, what did they used to teach us? When you become born again, you come with some demons from the family, generational curses of your grandfather and your great 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 grandfather. What part of me is new creature? Answer me. What part of me is new creature if I have my great 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 grand grandfather's great great devil? I was in the service once and some guy started repenting for a generational curse because we killed the Indian coolies. I laughed. <laughs> I said, this is too much. We, we killed the Indian coolies. So if their blood is on us, repent. We repented for Indian coolies. Father, we killed Sanjay. We killed Patel Priyesh, Father. Forgive us. We killed Vishal Mangal Wadi. We killed... <laughs> Somebody shout hallelujah. The Bible says, if a man is born again, he is a new creation. Behold, the old is past, and now the new. And I love the next line. And all things are of God. He has reconciled us to himself by Jesus. And he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Why? Because all things are of God. No, they are of God. But you still have a generational... Now I say, wait. I don't care how old I preached it. I had to repent of it. Oh no, even me I taught about generational curses. And I had short fixes too. Spirits used to scream out of people. But those women, I remember I cast out those devils out of. I remember again after some time I saw them and they were the same women. Older hair, a bit, and old bags, I think. But, <laughs> but they scrammed. They said, ah, the man of God is anointed. Somebody say a new creation. <laughs> the old is past. <laughs> and now the new. <laughs> and all things things are of God. All! Which part of all don't you understand? All things are of God. My prayer is of God. My family is of God. My understanding is of God. My meditation is of God. My body is of God. My history is of God. You change from the lineage of Karanja and who? And then you enter the lineage of John, Paul, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Abraham. Oh, come on, somebody! That's my new lineage. If you check my blood, it's different. He says we are members of his blood, his body, and his bones. We are members of his body, his flesh, and his bones. You can now tell me that what my grandfather did, I have to pay for it. Uh-uh. What, what did I do? Ah, you have to pay. And then they, they say, you remember that scripture which they quote, for he shall revisit the iniquity of our fathers from the third and fourth generation. And you know that's a problem with, with the spirit of religion. The Bible says it leaves out the weightier issues. Thank you. That's how it is finished. For those who hate him. Do you hate him? What? No, I don't hate him, but I'm revisiting. That is what I'm saying. They left out the weightier issue. He says, one, two, he scribes, Pharisees and Hebrews, for you pay tithe of meat and a meat and come in and have a meat at the weightier matters of the law, the judgment, and of faith. They live out weightier issues. Everything about religion is, it quotes the scripture halfway. Walk your salvation in fear and in trembling. You have to fear when you're walking. What is the next line? For it is God which works in you, both to will and to, why are they living out the part of God 
working in me because they want me to work instead of God working in me. That's what they call the grace message. Now when you preach it, they say, ah, this one is telling people to sin. So which light are they seeing the gospel? Are you following me? Am I making some sense? Let's go a bit deeper here. If for Christ, for liberty you have been set free. For liberty. For liberty. Jesus wanted liberty for you and set you free. He says, make sure you don't go back in bondage. That's the instruction. Every teaching of the New Testament is supposed to help men not to go back. But most of our teachings in church are to get men out. <laughs> You'll understand it. Most of our teachings are to t- let, get men out of bondage. Because we put them there in the first place. Through the teaching. Yet, our true teaching is supposed to be making men to stand in the freedom and not go back in bondage. We're supposed to teach men how not to get bound. We're not supposed to be, teach men how to get loose. But you see, the reason why sometimes it is necessary to teach men how to get loose it is because they are truly bound. And why are they bound? Because the gospel has not preached to them the right way. It is easier to walk standing in freedom than it is to try to come out of bondage. How many of you have understood what I just said? Now, Paul is raised in the same situation where the law had taken effect. You have heard now in the scriptures that now that saying shall not be said in Israel that the father ate of bitter fruits and their children's teeth are set on the edge. No, 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 no. What men see that you use this proverb concerning the land of Israel saying the fathers have eaten of sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on the edge? He says, as I live, said the Lord, you shall not have occasion anymore to use this proverb. The soul that sinned shall die. If your grandfather killed coolies, let him kill coolies. You have received Jesus Christ. You have no, you have no reason to pay the price of the dead somebody shout hallelujah you have no reason to pay the price of a dead coolie anymore say hallelujah now Paul is raised in that kind of culture now let me explain who Paul is so you understand why the New Testament has to be understood Paul the Bible says is a born of Tarsus Cilicia and he says it was no mean city it was like Athens or Rome. And when he was a teenager, about 15 or 16 of that age, because his father was a Pharisee of the lineage of the Pharisees, they were in diaspora. Athens, I mean uh, Cilicia Tarsus, was, was not in Jerusalem, right? And so therefore, because of that, he was raised speaking the Greek language very fluently because they were raised in diaspora. You understand? So he says, I am a man which am a Jew of Tarsus in a city of Cilicia, a city of no mean, a no mean city, and I beseech thee suffer me to speak unto you. This is a man born in Tarsus, Cilicia, speaking the Greek language under Roman rule. And the father is a Pharisee, and out of the zeal, he says, but I was raised in Jerusalem under the feet of Gamaliel. Gamaliel, who is Gamaliel? This is Paul raised under Gamaliel. I want you to follow this story very closely. And when Paul is raised under Gamaliel, the lawgiver, he is taught how to be a what? Yes. He says, I'm verily a man which I'm a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city of Cilicia, yet brought up in the city, at the feet of Gamaliel. And he was taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers. And he was zealous towards God. And you all know this day. Give me the Amplified of that. He says, I am verily a man. Uh-huh. I want to read the Amplified. I'm a Jew born in Tarsus, Cilicia. At the feet of Gamaliel, I was educated according to the strictest care. Listen, strictest care in the law of our fathers. Being ardent, even as zealous for God as all of you are today. He was now talking to men who were trying to be the way he was. So this was a man raised under Gamaliel. Who is Gamaliel? The Bible says Gamaliel was a doctor of the law. You remember the time when they were dealing the issue of these, are these guys true or not? And Gamaliel says these men. Uh-huh. The scriptures speak of Gamaliel as a doctor of the law. He was a doctor. 
He says his name Gamaliel, a doctor of the law, having in, had in reputation among all the people and commanded to put the apostles forth. He was a doctor in the law. So a man who is born in Tarsus, Cilicia, a Jew, a Pharisee, and inherit, inherent a child from the foundation of the Jewish culture, is shifted from Tarsus, Cilicia, speaking Greek well, he goes and sits under the feet of Gamaliel. Gamaliel raises him up in the way of the law of the fathers. When salvation comes later, Paul starts to look at these guys who have said Jesus has come as liars. Why? Because then the law of the teaching in Jerusalem was Judaism. Judaism is a teaching and up to today it exists in Israel. For those of you who have been in Israel, you realize that almost the true Christian movement in Israel is not even more than 20% of the population. 80% of them is either Jews or Judists or Islam, Muslims, and some Assists. They don't believe in this thing, you and I. Orthodox also, there's a very group of big Orthodox uh, group there. In fact, I was taken one time at the Wailing Wall and the Lord asked me. Anyway, let me not go there. I don't know why it's wailing. I don't know why we wail on that wall. Anyway, we shall talk with the men of God. They'll maybe advise me a bit. So, when Paul sees the church, he speaks in his very own words. He says, I persecuted the church of God and I wasted it. Why did Paul persecute the church? He says, for ye have heard of my past conversation in time. Give me the message Bible of that. He says, for ye have heard, I'm sure you've heard of the story of my earlier life when I lived in the Jewish way. In those days, I went all out in persecuting God's church. I was systematically destroying it. He was systematically, it was planned an affair to destroy the church. Yet he had the same uh, Septuagint. He was a believer, a devout man following God, convinced that he was serving God. He persecuted. In fact, some versions in the Acts book says, I persecuted this way. He calls it the way. When Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and life, okay? <laughs> he, Paul calls it in Galatians, I see somewhere in Acts, he says, I persecuted the way. He called it this way. I persecuted this way. Not as of manner, but as of the entity, Jesus, the way. He persecuted Christ. Anyway, I persecuted this way unto death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. He was zealous. He was even there at the death of who? Stephen. Stephen. He watched it all. And he was zealous. Now, here's a story. And I want you to follow. Follow. A time comes, and many of you know this story, but many of us, have our eyes have not been open to the experience of this, and that's what I want to show you. A time comes, and he knows his way to Damascus, and what happens? And he's taking these guys on the way, and a bright light shines to him. And the Bible says it was noon. Now, when the Bible says the bright light shined on a man when it was noon, this was not the light of the sun. Shout hallelujah. It was the light of Genesis 1-4, let there be light. It was in the Genesis of 1.14 and then he created firmaments of light in the sky, the sun, the moon, and the, for, for them to give light and day and they shall be for signs, days and seasons. No, he's not about the sun because it was noon. And at noon, a bright light shined. That, that means this light was brighter than the sun. Somebody shout hallelujah. That is the thing shining out of you. So, so why dost thou persecute us? me? Who are you, Lord? He designs him. And then God explains, casts him blind. From the vision of us. A couple of days later, you know the man of God and ears comes to him and opens his eyes. Right? And his eyes are open. And the moment Paul's eyes were open, how many of you remember the scripture? The moment Paul's eyes were open, eh? And look at how God is talking to the apostle. You might think he's a prophet. Go, he's in the house. He's in, not the same, but that one. He, he. Immediately there fell from his eyes that had been scales, and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. Give me the message Bible. Give me the message Bible. No sooner were the words out of his mouth than something like scales fell from Saul's eyes. He could see again, and he got to his feet and was baptized. And the Bible says, and sat down with them to a hearty meal. And Saul spent a few days getting acquainted with the Damascus disciples, but then went right to work. That was the, the challenge. Paul went right, right to work. Immediately when he had received Jesus Christ, he went right to work, wasting no time, preaching in the places. This was the revelation. Jesus is the Son of God. This is all Paul knew. This is all he knew. Jesus is the Son of God. Everywhere he went, 
Jesus is the son of God. Je- because he didn't want to waste time. Why? Because Judaism does not believe that Jesus came. Judaism believes in one coming, which is the end. They don't believe in him walking on the flesh. In fact, if you read the Judistic Creed, the 11th and 13th, you'll hear they say that there is no great prophet right now according to the Judistic teaching like Moses. Oh, isn't that the same prophet of the law? Isn't that the same law that we find in Islam, Sharia? Come on, somebody. Same thing. They're the same spirit. Roman Catholics is in the law. Even our Anglicans now and few Protestants who don't know what they are protesting, the law. <laughs> now, even some tongues speaking Pentecostals. So he went preaching Jesus is the Son of God. That was the highest revelation Paul was dealing with. And as he continues to preach Jesus is the Son of God, God tells Paul, there is something I want to show you. What does he do? He separates Paul from the Damascus group. And the Bible says he took him to a place called Arabia. Arabia is a deserted place. And I tell people that when you are in the wilderness, which is a deserted place, where God cuts you, in fact the word wilderness is translated as a place where God cuts you from the aid, the influence, and, 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 the aid, the influence, and the, the, the glory of the people who know you, your family, your friends. When you're undergoing a wilderness sort of experience, even your parents can separate themselves from you. And you think you have a demon. No, you're not, it's not rejection. God is separating you from himself. Such that you no longer look at your father as, as the source of your rent. Hallelujah. You start looking onto Jesus as the author and the finish of your faith. When you're going through the wilderness experience, three things happen. One, God kills you. Number two, God tests you into maturity. And number three, God teaches you himself. And I have not seen a man greatly used by God and he didn't have a wilderness experience. Some of you haven't yet. You're still in Damascus. So, Paul goes to Arabia. With one message, Jesus is. Now there's a challenge. The challenge is, he, he, went, he returned again into Damascus and spent there three years, right? And he started to see results like he had not seen before. What? And he, you, you, you see, I think, neither went I up to Jerusalem. Give me the, the message of that. He says, neither went I up, I, I, without going up to Jerusalem to confer with those which were apostles long before I was, I got away to Arabia and later I returned to Damascus. And the next one says, but it was three years before I went up to Jerusalem. Now, the Bible says here in the message that after three, after three years of preaching in Damascus, he went to Peter to compare stories. Because even though they were born again, they still beheld Moses. They believed in Jesus and they believed in the teaching of Moses. So Paul says, let me go. We need to teach this version in Fanero. Now, Peter goes, I mean, Paul goes to Peter. And then he says, Peter, I want us to compare stories. And, and Paul says, I was there 15 days, but what days they were? Meaning, they argued. <laughs> they were not easy days. And I think this, this, this gospel, grace, was very complicated for Paul to understand, for Peter to understand. You see? And the next verse says, next verse, next verse, and what happened? When, James, when Peter understood it, he also took Paul to James and told him, James, this chap is speaking things. That is why later Peter comes through and he says, and we know the long suffering of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and his forgiveness, of which things our brother Paul speaks in them. Things which are too hard. Peter even knew me saying, these things are hard, I believe in them. He says, also speaking in the peace, speaking of them things which are, in some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, rest means twist, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. And the next verse says, Ye therefore, beloved, this is Peter speaking, seeing ye know these things, before, beware, lest you also be led away with the error of the wicked, and you follow from your steadfastness. And the next verse says, But, grow in the law. Grow in the law. No. Don't fall back. Stay steady. Grow in grace. And in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 
to him be glory and now and forever somebody shout amen, amen. are you following me yes. grace is not a new thing it is older than many of us all of us grace is an old doctrine it is just debated over every generation if you read the first uh, awakening the first great awakening george whitfield right Barton james they wake up they start preaching grace during that time many of the wesleyans both john and james uh, and charles they were not agree in agreement they were in a war from was it i think 1741 up to 1743 they were fighting grace law, grace law. When the Wesleyans understood the grace message, that was the birth of what you and I call the Great Awakening. When the Second Great Awakening began, a similar thing began. They began under the Spirit, but they were under the law. And eventually something started to die in the middle until Grandison Finney came to understood the grace gospel, and that was the beginning and the strengthening of the grace, uh, grace revelation, as we know it. How did the Wesleyans understand grace? Because the Moravians embraced it. And the Moravians are known and appreciated as the one gem in history that has written some of the most beautiful hymns as we all know them. You hear these hymns and you're like, this is so clear. Before the throne of God above I have a strong and perfect plea a great high priest whose name is love whoever lives and pleads for me whoever for me uh-huh no needs No tongue can be me that's deeper. No tongue can be me that. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt we upward I of God and his forgiveness for sins and how 
by the law no flesh shall be justified. You understand what I'm saying? How by the law no flesh shall be justified? How that if by one man's sin all were what? Yes, sin and death reign because of one man's sin. Much more they that receive him. Jesus Christ. You see, he's trying to explain something. A baby dies because of, of the Adamic nature that dies. Why does it die? Because of the consequence of sin. The wages of sin is death. Isn't it? So your baby dies because of the Adamic sin. Is it fair? Now, when God forgives a man in spite of his weakness, it is not fair, but for you, again, you don't want it. It is not fair for a baby to die because of the Adamic sin. But also, when it comes to Jesus forgiving a man for free, again, for you, again, it's not fair. What do you want? Is it fair that a baby dies because of the Adamic sin? Did the baby sin? So if the baby didn't sin but yet dies, why is it that when a man is acquitted of all his sin in spite of his weakness, you have a problem? Who are you having a problem with? God who forgives. That the Bible calls that an evil eye. You remember the servants? The Bible says they hired one in the morning, in the midday, in the evening, and then the guy in the evening, the guy in the morning says, Why have you paid the guy in the evening the same wage? And God asked this man, Are you now questioning my mercy? The Bible calls that an evil eye. Is your eye evil? Because I'm good. <laughs> Some people, they, they, they have submitted their, the church to their grace. When their grace gets over, they think God's grace also is over. We've chased girls out of church because they've become pregnant. What are they doing now? They are boating to stay in the choir. So who is more dangerous? They are boating because church will not understand. They, they will not understand. They will not understand. They can't understand. And even that girl is the same like you who looked at a man and your eyes became like this. Because when you look at a woman, you have committed lust already. You are not different. But why the church can't understand? Do you know how many people we've chased out of church? We found one time a girl and she was sick in the world. We asked her to come back to church and she says no. She, was, we went to, she used to go to a certain church. And when she became pregnant, they threw her out because they had nothing, no business with evildoers. It pained me to the core when the girl looked at us straight in the eye and said, when your God chased me out, the, level loved, the devil loved me. When your God chased me out, the devil loved me. I have no business to come back to a God who chased me out of the church. Why? Because every time you speak that, People think we are telling people that it's okay to sin. Nobody who is born of God can deliberately read that scripture, by the way. Some of you should be writing notes. The Bible says in John, give me the amplified of that. Who so, no one, somebody say no one, begotten of God, deliberately, habitually, knowingly practices sin. Nobody. If a person wakes up and says, ah, now because I'm under grace, let me do this. You're not yet born again. Uh -uh. The issue is not that you're a sinning believer. No, you are not yet born again. That's the truth. A man who is born again cannot. Why? Because God's nature abides in him and his principles of life. His divine sperm remains permanently in him. And he cannot because he's born of God. He's talking about the spirit man. That is why when they asked Paul, shall we continue to sin so good should come? Paul asks, how? He didn't say, he didn't just end on no. Like some religious people think. Paul said, how? How, how do you continue sinning when you are a new creature? And Peter says, you are born of an incorruptible seed. If your seed is incorruptible, how can you wake up and just continue? Because grace is available. Paul says, no, that is a person who is not born again. A person who is born again cannot use forgiveness as an excuse. Grace is saving. It is not license. Hallelujah, somebody. Amen. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Now I want to rush this through so I finish so you can go back home. Yes, amazing grace. Now, Paul, 
is a midst guys <laughs> who are both preaching grace and now you remember the scriptures how one time uh, we encounter a situation where they were Pharisees that had believed. That means they had believed, but they stayed in the law. And uh, these guys went through with a few Jewish proselytes in the congregations and started preaching the circumcision of Moses with salvation. They are, even though you're saved, you have to add on circumcision. You remember that story? They came from Judea to the brethren, except you be circumcised after the man of Moses. You got to be saved. And amazingly, to show you that this is the spirit of the law, God never had a covenant of circumcision with Moses. He had it with Abraham. But how it is in the manner of Moses, I don't know how Moses claims it, the law. You understand? Now, contentions ensue. And when the contentions ensue, because many of the guys who were sent out were unskilled and inexperienced, now a challenge comes through. We need to find out what's the truth. So they all agree. I think in Acts 15, 15, 16, 17, they agree, let us all go to Jerusalem and talk about these issues. There had been much disputing. So the dispute comes through. And there is a dispute. Paul and Barnabas are testifying of the good things God is doing in Jerusalem. But then there is also an opposite group of guys who are, are saying, no, for us we believe the law has to be given also while grace comes through. Now the dispute comes through. These legal guys start giving opinions. And when the disputing comes through, Peter, whom Paul contacted earlier, you remember the one they compared notes on. While everyone was talking, Peter stood up. Give me the message. Peter rose up and took the floor. He says, friends, you well know that from early on God made it quite plain that he wanted the pagans to hear the message of this good news and embrace it. And not in any second hand or roundabout way, but first hand straight from my mouth. This is Peter. Because he opened the, the door to the Gentile church. Remember in the house of Cornelius? He was not called to the Gentiles, but he opened the door. God called him to the Jew. It's in Galatians. But he opened the door. And God who can't be fooled by any pretense on our part, but always knows a person's thoughts, gave them the Holy Spirit exactly as he gave them to us. And the Bible says, and he treated the outsiders exactly as he treated us, beginning at the very center of who they were, and working from the center outward, cleaning up their lives as they trusted and believed. They didn't do anything. They simply trusted and believed. When they trusted and believed, he started cleansing them. For us, we are telling people that when we circumcise, you will become better. When you do this, you will become better. When you do that, you will become better. They say, no. You see, when we are talking about the law, there is civil law, there is ceremonial laws, and then there is the law of the Ten Commandments. They are talking of the civil and ceremonial, not the law, not the law of Moses. No, go and read. The translation, the literal word is nomos, which means both civil, ceremonial, and the Ten Commandments. Now listen. So, why are you, listen, now trying to out-God God, loading these new believers down with rules that crushed our ancestors and crushed us too? Now, you remember why the Bible says the law kills? This thing crushed the ancestors. And the next verse says, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, continue. Don't we believe that we are saved because the master Jesus, amazingly and out of sheer generosity, moved to save us just as he did for those from beyond our nation? So, what are we arguing about? Peter remembers that when the Jews, when the, the, the house of Cornelius received the Holy Spirit, he didn't first give them the law. The Gentiles didn't know the law. That is why now the church in Jerusalem, right now, is dead. And the Gentile church is thriving. That's why I don't understand a Gentile who is under the law. I am trying to understand. The law was not meant for the Gentile, it was for the Jew. The law wasn't for you. Anyway, you'll understand in a few minutes. So, this is where now the rubber meets the road. This is now where many questions are coming in your head. I'm going to answer them. So, next verse says, there was dead silence. No one said a word like some of you are silent now. <laughs> With the room quiet, Barnabas and Paul reported, listen now, this is how the guys who are preaching grace, of faculty on the miracles and wonders God had done among the nations through their ministry. And the next verse says, silence deepened. <laughs> He says you could hear a pin drop. <laughs> then, the person to whom Paul was taken after Peter, James, he stood up. Friends, listen. Simeon has told us the story of how God at very onset made sure that the racial outsiders were included. 
This is in perfect agreement with the words of the prophets. After this, I'm coming back. I'll rebuild David's ruin. I'll put all the pieces together. And it's amazing that God is rebuilding David's temple, not Moses. Praise the Lord. I'll make it look like new. And next verse is, so outside Azul will seek fine so they'll have a place to come. All the pagan cooking in what I'm doing. God said it and now he's doing it. And next verse is, it's not after thought. He, always known, he has always known he would do this. So here is my decision. We are not going to unnecessarily burden non-Jews who turn to the master. We'll write them a letter and tell them, be careful not to get involved in activities connected with idols, to guard the morality of sex and marriage, not to serve offensive food to Jews, Christians, the blood, for instance. For this is basic wisdom from Moses, preached and honored for centuries. Now in the city after city, we have met and kept the Sabbath. Everyone agreed, and the apostles and all leaders, they all picked Judas, Barnabas, Silas, and they both carried considerable weight of the church and sent them in Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They told all these funny guys who were legal, they told them to stay back. And they sent back Paul and Barnabas to correct the error. And they told them, let's not put on them this law. Go back to that part where he says, let us not put on them the law. Uh, uh, oh, this, this, yeah. Uh-huh. Give me the amplified of that. He says, we should send a word to them in writing. No, 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 before that, up before, before. Uh-huh. It is my opinion that we should not put obstacles in the way and annoy and disturb those of the Gentiles who turn to God. Because let us now not bring into these other things. But we can advise them of the three basic things Moses spoke because they are right to do so. Abstain from. And number two. Eating meat of animals that has been strangled by blood. And what else? Sexual purity. And then there's a third. Idols. Those are three. He says, let's warn them to avoid those three. But don't give them Moses. Don't give them Moses. One of them is because we don't want the, the Israel the, them to stumble Christians who are still in the Jewish system by eating things, uh, blood of animals and stuff. But after that, please let us not go. Now let's continue. Let's continue a bit. I want to interest you on in something. Uh huh. Continue down, down, down. Everyone agreed. Next verse. Uh huh. So this was the letter. We had that some men from our church went to you and said things that confused and upset you. Mind you, they have no authority from us. We didn't send them. Now, they even denied them. <laughs> they denied them. Am I, am I making sense, men of God? Anyway, fast forward. The church in Gentile community grew. The Bible says in Corinthians... <laughs> That by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law is the knowledge of sin. He says, therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh shall be justified, for the law is the knowledge of sin. That means, if you want people to know sin, what do you do? The Corinthian book says, that the, the one, I think that's the one I was talking about, it says that the sting of sin is death, and the strength of sin is the law. Now, that means, now let me ask common sense. If you want to strengthen sin in the church, what do you preach? <laughs> what strengthens sin? Uh-huh. When you tell people, don't sleep around, what are you telling them? Sleep when you tell people, don't come late, what are you telling them? I'm not saying that you can't rebuke people who are funny. I'm not saying that you can't correct people who are walking out of, you know. But you don't correct them by telling them what not to do. You correct them by telling them who they are. A child of God should not indulge in this. A child of God cannot indulge in this. They'll pick it. You understand? He's a child of God is not supposed to do this until they're married. That's it. They'll get it. But don't tell them don't. Them, oh yeah. You... You watch when you tell children, don't touch. They'll just... <laughs> because do, don't creates the, the, the urge to do. You know, human beings, the human mind, 
was never created with a reverse not to do wiring. It's not in your mind. If I tell you don't eat pork, you'll see pork eating it. You see? The human mind was never created. You can't press reverse. I tell you, don't steal. You see yourself doing like this. Because human nature was never created to fulfill the law. No flesh can be justified. Praise the Lord. And as you continue to preach the forgiveness of the Lord, the love of the Lord, I started to see people walking out of sin. Yeah. Romans 2, 4, 6. Is it 4, 6? It is the goodness of the Lord that leadeth men to repentance. Not your anger. It's the goodness of God. The more we preach goodness, men will what? But some people despise the riches of his goodness and forbearings and long suffering, not knowing the goodness of the Lord and repentance. Some say that there is forgiveness with thee that they might fear thee. Why do men fear God? Because he's angry. No, because he's forgiving. He's merciful. That's what some says. Can you believe it? That forgiveness with God is what makes men fear. But you, what did they teach you? Some of us, when we came to salvation through Satan, is God will burn you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so many people don't know the love of God. And I said to see that the more I preached love, forgiveness, mercy, men walked out. Men walked out of even the worst sins registered in history. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. The wrath of man worketh not righteousness. Some of you think that the more angry you become on the pulpit. One time I was standing in front of a man who was saying, I will speak whether you leave the church or you don't leave church. Then they started putting the law. And people started moving out. You go. If you're going, I hope you die. You will not make it at home. People just continued parking. The, the man was annoyed. Even if you move out, me, I'll stay alone in this church. But I'll speak the truth. <laughs> The letter. And this man was strangling and killing people. <laughs> and some, some of them, the moment they were getting tired of being killed, they woke out. <laughs> Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. hallelujah. This is the message. Hallelujah. This is the gospel. People can't live by Moses. You, you go in a mosque, they say, don't steal. You come to church, don't steal. You go in a mosque, don't commit adultery. You come to church, don't commit adultery. What's the difference between the church and the mosque? Praise the Lord. Now, then we say, okay, what do we do with people who are walking out or walking in sin? Simple. Show them how much God has loved them. To whom much... Oh, the Bible says, whoever is forgiven much, do they continue sinning? No. What do they do? First Corinthians 13, 8 says, love never fails. Reveal the love of God, pastors, people will walk out of sin. People will walk out of bondage. Tell the believer, it doesn't matter what you've done, God is still on your side and he wants to wash you. You remember the teaching of how I shall do to my vine? If it grows thistles and grows madness, because you're the vine, right? Yeah. Eh? Your God's growing, your God's husbandry. You are He's the planting of the Lord. He says, Can you take me to that scripture? Let me probably finish with that. Huh? Where is that scripture? Who knows where it is? Can you take me to that scripture? Huh? What he does to his uh, planting. Uh uh. Is it is it so? Uh, I'll go back before, before, before. At the same time a fine vine will appear, there is some to sing about. I God tend it, I keep it well watered. I keep careful watch over it so that no one can damage it. I'm not angry, I care. Even if it gives me thistles and thorn bushes, 
I'll just pull the thistles and stone bushes out, and I'll burn them. And after burning them, I'll still continue with my apostle. That is what he wants to do. If you have an issue, for him he'll pull it out and still continue with you. Some of you, you were lied to now that you have done this sin. You are gone. Your ministry is gone. You'll never. That you are gone. You, you are, you are buried. Today when I say, they say, ah, a pastor was caught with a woman. That's it. You're gone. Roman, Roman Catholic Church, these fathers are sodomizing boys and they are restoring them and posting them in other places and they are still serving. The Pentecostals are killing their own. We are not saying we are supporting sin. We're only saying that that's not what has to... David messed up. But even when he did, God separated him from his weakness. I know some of you don't want to hear it because you think I'm telling people to sin. But it is still the truth. I'll still preach the truth. God didn't write off David and tell him, you're not my man. No, he still said, you're still a man after my own heart. That's why David says, blessed is the Lord of whom the Lord imputes not sin. But righteousness. You're not righteous because of what you did last week. You're righteousness because of your faith in Christ Jesus. That is why I love the way one man called Cobas said one time. They asked him, what is the one thing you regret in history when you go back to your life of salvation? He said nothing. So the man asked him, you mean you don't remember the things you've done wrong in the gospel? He says, I don't remember them. Why? Because... I can't remember what God forgot. <laughs> That's the truth. He says, and I shall take away your sins. He says, a new covenant shall I make, hallelujah, with the children of Israel. And he says, I shall write my laws, my laws, not the laws of Moses, but my laws on their hearts. And I shall put my spirit in them. He says, and I will, I will take away the stony heart and I will give you a heart of flesh. And the Bible says, next verse, next verse, hello, and I will put my spirit within you. And what will I do? What will I do? And what will I do? What will I do? What will I do? He said, I will cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them. And the next verse says, and you shall dwell in the land that I gave your fathers and you shall be my people and I will still be your God. I'll also save you from all your uncleanliness and I will call you for the corn and I will increase it and I will know no famine upon you. Somebody shout hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah. I will multiply the fruit of the tree and the increase of the field that you shall receive no more reproach or famine among your brethren. Then shall you remember your evil ways. This is how he, he causes them to, to repent by being good to them. There is a verse that says, and I shall forgive their sins, and I will throw them away to the ends of the earth. And God said, I shall remember them no more. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. I will remember them no more. Because it's a new covenant. I will remember them. God doesn't even remember what you did last week. Isn't that saying that you're telling people to sin? No. Let me also get into the, the realm of logic. Do you know how the devil feels when you're forgiven? Let's enter the realm of logic. Let me think with you. Reason. Do you know how the devil feels when God has not counted it on you? So, uh, uh, why are you feeling worse than the devil feels? Are you hearing me? When you embrace the love of God, the forgiveness of God, the righteousness of God, you're, you're, you're going to start to see your body respond to truth. What was a struggle? I, I gave a testimony recently. A pastor came in my meetings and told me I had failed to stop drinking for 15 years. As a pastor, nobody knew as a drunkard because I used to get drunk at home every night. When I embrace God's love and forgiveness on me, he says, I've not touched a bottle. We have people who have walked out of homosexuality, perversions. Women have packed their bags and left uh, funny men because... They have embraced grace. And they have peace with God because they know they are forgiven. You, you might have not forgiven her, but uh, I swear, God forgave her. You know, this is more annoying to the devil. 
Not to us saints. Because you know we all fall short. He says for all have sinned. And fall short of the glory of God. No he didn't say and continue to be sinners. All have sinned is a past tense. That's why they call you saints. I wonder how legal people fight grace. When they call themselves all saints church. <laughs> anyway. He says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Being justified, 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 free by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Justified free. Oh, I, God will never use me. I did this in 1975. Guess what? You're reminding him of what he doesn't remember. Look forward. Paul says one thing that I do only. Is I set my eyes on things ahead of me. If you made a mistake, forget it. Forgive yourself. You are forgiven. Don't do it again. Move on. You can still have the best in this life. God's mind on you has not changed. But there are people who say, for you, you're gone. Praise the Lord. The challenge that kills many of us is we refuse to embrace it. We refuse to embrace grace. We refuse to embrace grace. We refuse to embrace it. We have refused to embrace it. We have refused to receive grace. We still want to judge ourselves on the Lord because we think we can still do better in our own strength. This is what grace is. Grace is, I can't, God, you can't through me. The law is, I don't need you. Let me first show you that I can. That is why many of you, when you go to repentance, you tell God, I'm sorry I did it. I'm going to do better next time. Ah, you will worsen. Because I did it, I'm going to do better. I'm fixing it myself. You, the moment you put you, you're gone. When you go to God, tell him, God, even with this weakness, I thank you because you're my righteousness. I thank you because you have shed your blood for me. Because you count me worthy to be amidst your own. You love me with an everlasting love. That is called repentance. The Greek word metanoia, to change your mind. Repentance is not the tears you cry. It's the mind that is changed. To put it back again to the gospel. Wake up every morning and say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. Devil, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. Devil, I have received salvation and forgiveness through Christ. Devil, the Lord does not count that on me. For I am forgiven and I'm a man of God and this shall not happen again in my life because God works in me both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. Hallelujah. And as you continue to do that, your life will start having a turn as you embrace the goodness of God. It's what brings true repentance. The more you fall into a weakness, look to the goodness of God, not the anger of God. I'll give you one more in Isaiah. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me to preach the... Okay, two more. To preach the good news to the what? To the poor. Right? Remember? The spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach the good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to open the prisons to them that are bound. And the next verse says, to proclaim the acceptable hour of the Lord on the day of vengeance of our God. The day of vengeance. Isaiah said it. Jesus also opened the same scripture in Luke. Same scripture. And he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Send me to heal the broken hearted. Preach deliverance to the captives. Recovering the sight of the blind. To set at liberty them that are bruised. And the next verse says, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. When he got to the air of vendors, he closed it. I didn't come to preach vengeance. For the son of man, the Bible says, was not sent to condemn the world. Through him, all men that believe shall be saved. Hallelujah! Close the book, man of God. He says, for the Son of God was not sent to condemn the world. He was not sent to condemn the world. But that the world through him might be saved. Acts 13, he preaches the gospel. And he says, be known unto you, brethren, that through this man is the forgiveness of sins. And the Bible says, next verse, and by him all that believe are justified from all things which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Remember, like, wait. 
there is justification in this man and what does the next verse say I, I be aware therefore lest that come upon you which is spoken in the prophets for you despise us and wander and perish for I walk a walk in your days we shall in no winds believe though a man declare it and what does the next verse say and when the Jews were gone out of the synagogues the Gentiles called Paul aside that he might the Bible says they be so that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath they said ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. did you say there is forgiveness not the judgment of Moses but forgiveness through this man there is justification by simply believing not doing anything yes believing the disciples came to jesus what might we do that we might do the works of god they were waiting for the seven ways he told us uh -uh, there's only one work one 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 believe the bible says in john that he shall judge the world of sin not because they sin but because they believe not on him but whosoever believes there is now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus for the law of the life giving spirit has set them free from the law of sin and death now Paul is speaking in Acts the, the Gentiles besought him on the synagogue and they said come and preach this was the next Sabbath and the next verse says and when the congregation was broken up many of the Jews and religious proselytes they followed Paul and Barnabas if you go to Acts 13 beginning, he was Saul. When he preached grace, he became Paul. No, when you go to Acts 13 first, he says, they say, separate me. So Barnabas and Saul. In fact, in the spirit, Barnabas came before Saul. Saul was second to Barnabas. Yes, he says, separate me, Barnabas and Saul. When the man preached grace, it now turns, Paul gets ahead of Barnabas and is now Paul. That was the true conversion of the preacher. God converted him to Saul, lawmaker, giver, to the man of grace. And then he says, the next day, they followed them, right? Barnabas, who's speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And the next verse says, and the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came. The next Sabbath, the whole why, how come you have many people after three years? I'm preaching Paul's message. Somebody shout hallelujah. That's why the city comes. Somebody say, ah, you're preaching people, you're sinning. No, then Paul is a sinner. All Jesus was worse. He fed 5,000 men followed him. That then it should be. Some people think that the more righteous you are, the more people become. No, go away. So the next verse says, the next verse says, listen listen and but when the jews saw the multitudes eh, they were filled with envy and started speaking against the things which were spoken by paul contradicting and blaspheming why are they doing that envy when your church starts to grow you'll become cult false teacher extreme grace preacher they call me all those things in my country and i say call me call me every thursday we see souls coming to christ men walking out of sin and jesus is glorified let them talk continue preaching the truth some of you you fear your fellow pastors what they'll hear when you start preaching okay you you be a man pleaser i choose to please god that is the message of the gospel somebody shout hallelujah raise your hands and thank god for his love come and just take a minute and thank god for his love thank you lord jesus thank you lord jesus that's the question i wanted to ask that's the question i wanted to ask if you are a man the, the word i promised you has reminded me the question i needed to ask you if you have been in the church for so long do you now realize that we've preached this thing so wrong for so long after this someone do you realize that we have preached our anger and wrath we've put it on the altars we have become judges of men we have taken the righteousness of god as though it is something to be worked for and we have now perfected righteousness in human effort which is filthy rags now do you see why churches are not growing they're not preaching the truth he said if you lift me up i'll draw me to myself grow ye in grace then someone says but you need to balance the only balance in scripture is grace and faith you can't balance the law and grace the law kills how can you balance yourself between death and life that's double-mindedness you shouldn't expect anything from god 
celebrate grace just take a minute come on just thank god for grace